Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's presentation entitled Plant to Product, two key technologies driving the production of cannabis beverages and water-soluble powders. My name is Eva Gurgina. I'm the Director of Marketing at Industrial Sound Mechanics. And here I also have Dr. Alexei Peshkovsky, President and Chief Scientific Officer of Industrial Sound Mechanics, as well as Dr. John Thompson, Chief Executive Officer at Extract Lab. So today we'll discuss the process of nanoemulsification and extraction, specifically um, how you prepare and um, process nanoemulsify the extract properly in order to create a high quality uh, water soluble finished product. So um, now let's go ahead and begin the discussion with a brief overview of the two, two technologies. Um, can you each tell us, um, tell our viewers what your technology does? Sure, why, why don't you go first, doctor? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> uh, we are a research and development company, uh, mainly focusing on making it possible to mix things that otherwise don't like to mix. Uh, so a good example of that is oil and water. Everyone knows that no matter how vigorously you stir oil into water, as soon as you stop doing that, they will separate and, and oil will just flow to the top. Uh, that's unfortunate because many, if not most, bioactive substances, including CBD, THC, and lots of other things, pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, are oil compatible. They're basically oils. And so you can't really make beverages with them because they will separate out. And uh, you can't really efficiently deliver them into the, the body, into the bloodstream, because we are mainly water. And our blood is most certainly mainly water. So um, making them... Um, water compatible or apparently water soluble solves several, several issues. Um, th this is where our technologies uh, come in. What we offer is basically a complete solution to making oils and other non-water soluble substances behave as if they were water soluble, approximate true solutions. It consists of um, ultrasonic processing equipment which is scalable and it, uh, it is there to create sufficiently high, extremely high shear forces that will break up one of the liquids, specifically oil in the oil and water case, into nano droplets, or if it's crystals, uh, break them up into nano crystals. Uh, you can also make uh, liposomes, which are also nanoparticles, basically create nanoparticles that would be suspended in water and stabilized in such a way that uh, the, the behavior of this mixture will be similar to a true solution. The other side of this uh, sort of puzzle and, and what we offer is the formulations, uh, nano stabilizer, all-in-one formulations, what we call them, there, there are several options. And their function is to, first of all, help in the creation of these small particles. And also once the particles are created, they uh, need to be stabilized. So the other function is to make sure that these particles once formed remain unchanged uh, over basically uh, uh, arbitrarily long period of time, years typically. Uh, and, and with that, you can create um, both liquid and solid water compatible formulations called nanoemulsions or water-soluble nanoemulsion powders that can be infused into beverages uh, or compressed into tablets in case of powders or just uh, uh, dissolved into water like sugar packet type, type stuff. Uh, and in doing so, first of all, uh, you, you gain convenience of application and you gain function. So uh, the bioavailability increases and the onset of action is much shorter. And now I can explain a little bit later uh, why that happens. So this is mainly what we focus on for the cannabis industry, but also for the pharmaceutical, nutraceutical, and similar industries. Awesome. Well, I, I that's a hard act to follow. Uh, it, <laughs> it's, uh, it really is the cutting edge of, of all that really matters when it comes to, <clears throat> when it comes to formulations. There's so many, um, you know, oil soluble drugs uh, that are not biocompatible out there right now. And there, and interestingly enough, there's there's not a lot of um, really good oil soluble uh, you know 
formulations. If you look up, you know, books of, um, you know, like pharmaceuticals that have these different formulations, some of them are self emulsification systems, some of them have, you know, surfactants associated with them. What's, what's kind of curious and what's kind of cool about what you guys do is, you know, a lot of times uh, the consumer with uh, the CBD and the hemp world or, or THC, they want to have something that tastes good or has a certain um, uh, experience associated with it. So that's a whole nother level as opposed to, uh, you know, just imbibing, a, um, you know, an emulsified material. So um, hats off to you guys. It's, it's really awesome, Dr. Alexi. And um, I can give you a little overview of my company. Um, Extract Lab is a company we've been in business since uh, 20, well, uh, 2009. Uh, and um, we really started getting into the, um, you know, kind of the cannabis world right around 2015. Um, we spent a lot of time with, uh, you know, uh, basically building up uh, multi-state operators, uh, spent a tremendous amount of time in Canada. And uh, since that time, we put uh, hundreds and hundreds of people into the business of, you know, making extracts, uh, building up a facility, putting out products, whether they be uh, gummies or uh, vapor pens or whatever, um, or if they're just doing bulk oils, uh, whether they do, you know, uh, isolates or crystals or whatever, we, we, we help them get to the point where they can actually, um, you know, produce, uh, produce products uh, that will be consumed by consumers. So um, we've done that in uh, the United States, Canada, uh, South and Central America, uh, in, in, out in Europe and um, Africa, um, and then over in the other continents, uh, over in, um, you know, Australia and so on and so forth. So we've had a great time. Um, and as we've kind of gone along over the years, we've really created a lot of different products. So our main products, uh, doctor, are, you know, we have extractors uh, and we make different types of extractors, um, depending on what solvent you want to use. Um, we specialize in cryogenic uh, solvents. So anything that are CO2 or cryogenic, they, we know how to move those fluids around. They, they produce special requirements for pumping and handling. So we know how to do that. So CO2 extraction, for example, will be one of our fortes. Uh, also, um, we've done a lot of extractions um, and solid phase extractions and liquid liquid extractions. We've been involved in that since 2009. Uh, we've with uh, nanostructured carbons, um, doing selective separations. We also have very large scale chromatography machines uh, that separate out, you know, um, maybe in, in the case of, um, you know, a typical customer, they'd want to separate out CBD and THC to create a, you know, kind of a, uh, a THC free solution for themselves. So that would be kind of broad spectrum. We have chromatography equipment, we have uh, distillation equipment also, white film distillation, and also uh, try, try reactor distillations, trickle reactors, um, you know, falling film react, fall film evaporators and things like that. So we've been very, very busy, um, you know, creating products. It's just like, well, that's what we do, you know, product creators going to create. And so, um, we've also done some really good work with, uh, um, you know, kind of the software side, we have some software stuff. So that's, that's essentially what we do. And, um, you know, the, a lot of the formulations that with our customers, when we, when we talk to them about, hey, what, you know, what is it that you guys want to do? A lot of times they'll start off with something very, very simple. Like, okay, I want a tincture or I want to have a gummy or I want to have an edible like a brownie or something like that. And those are pretty straightforward. But uh, as soon as you get into the point where they like, okay, what I really want to have is I want to have a beverage or I want to have a... Um, I want to have a, a, you know, kind of a, and then I have all these different requirements on top of that. That's where we call Dr. Alexi and his crew and say, hey, you guys need to really step up to the plate here and, and help our customers really decide what those, those types of things are and, and get, get, fulfill their requirements because they're kind of complex. It, sometimes it takes development. Nothing is straightforward because everybody has their own requirements. So there's a necessarily a methods development that goes on with that. So um, can you tell us about some of your experiences, Dr. Alexi, along those lines? And, and you know, what, what are some of the um, requirements that some customers might come up with that are, are maybe difficult or, or, or that you guys have solved in terms of what the requirements would be? I know like, like taste would be one, you know, clarity, color would be another, you know, things like that. Can we talk a little bit about what your solutions um, do and help for those uh, areas? 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks for this uh, the background. It's awesome. It's awesome. I, I I think it's very complimentary what we do because we can't do what we do without you're doing what what you're doing because we entirely depend on the quality of the extract that we're starting with. Like you said, it's the pharmaceutical industry is actually in a way easier because when someone is sick, they the taste is not what they're really going right. to care about. They just want to get well. So you can afford to be a little harsher with your formulations and, and a little bit more kind of like robust and force the issue with it. But when it's a voluntary kind of recreational thing, especially if it's not something that gives you an immediate effect, but more of a, a over time type thing, which is like CBD, um, then everything needs to be agreeable and, and right. pleasant. And, and so we, with 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 our side of things, we can make things functionally um, improved. We can make them compatible with water, and so it's more convenient to to apply them. But we can't change the the, the raw material that will be delivered. So it, it's not a chemical process what we do. It's a physical process of making things compatible. But we're not changing any molecules. We're just packaging them in, in a different way. Right. So. If this starting material doesn't have the taste that 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 uh, people like, or doesn't have all the the, the constituents that that people can take advantage of, there's nothing we can do about that. Right. We make sure that our formulations themselves are tasteless, so we don't add any taste issues. But we also it, it's it's not easy to mask things. It's definitely hard to make things taste neutral. It's maybe possible to put another taste on top of some other taste and right. confuse people, but, but people people are not easily confused. <laughs> it's an amazing <laughs> device we have in our know. mouth. <laughs> it's a, yeah, you the can, best detector. Can, I mean, it really detects everything, doesn't it? Um, yeah. yeah, for sure. So, uh, for sure. so what it's kinds of things... With, when you, with, it's easier yeah, with alcohol. Like, you get somebody drunk, then you can feed them anything. But <laughs> oh, that's true. Well, we should make alcohol uh, substances. Uh, that'd be a good idea. So yeah, I mean, we, you know, in terms of us, like we would provide, like uh, we would teach our customers to make, you know, crude oil, which would have, you know, all the waxes and all the fats, all the terpenes, I, all the flavonoids in them. Oftentimes, we produce. Um, we we also teach them how to take a lot of those terpenes. Um, you know, that are volatile out ahead of time so that they're available for post formulation. Um, and then after that, they, some people like to take the waxes of those heavy waxes, they like to take those out. So that's what's called winterized oil. And then after that, um, some people like to increase the potency. And so they will, um, they will distill it. So there's actually, there's, there's four or five different items there that are coming out of that process. The first would be the pure terpenes. The second would be the crude oil, which is has everything in it. The third would be a winterized oil, which has a lot of the uh, waxes taken out of it. And then there's the wax fraction that is actually usable. And then there's the distillate also that comes out of that. And th that distillation process also produces um, you know, some wonderful, uh, not, not wonderful, actually horrible terpenes. You, you would never want to put them in. They do not taste good. They do not that's smell good. good. They, they're great. like, okay, throw them away, you know? So I'll have, I'll, I'll have questions on this. Uh, let's yeah. So what, what do you, what do you, what do you like best uh, in terms of your, um, what, what meets the criteria best for coming up with the, the least tasteless, uh, the least um, or, or maybe the most effective, maybe they're separate, you know, maybe the most effective comes out of crude oil and the, and the least tasteless comes out of, uh, like an isolate, right. which one is better? Yeah. So it's a good question. I, I think we can build up to this. I'll, I'll have some questions for you specifically on that. Okay. Um, but, um, why don't we do this? I, I, I have a couple of slides. Yeah. And so I can kind of introduce the, the reason that, that, this works and how exactly it works, what ways we use to characterize these things. And it will kind of lead us to the raw material related questions, which are many and, and challenging. Uh, I, you know, lots of things that we can't ourselves uh, figure out to, to a good oh, No level. problem, let's, 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 let's dig in. I'd like to see what you got. Yeah, so, okay, so let me get into 
share the screen. I think you should be seeing my screen now. Are you seeing yep. it? Okay. Yeah. So, um, nano emulsions basically solve for two things. One is convenience, and the other is function. Mm -hmm. uh, convenience is well. Um, currently, if you that's actually going to lead to to questions to you um, because the the um, the quality of the extractor, the type of extract, really depends on what you're going to do with it, right? So if you're going to vape right. it versus nano emulsion out of it, it, might be a completely different extract that you're looking Absolutely. for. Absolutely. Yeah. So so that's 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 a good thing to remember for later. So um, convenience is well. Look at what you have to do with extracts without without being able to make them water compatible. You have to vape them, dab them, spray them, uh, put them under your tongue, put them into alcohol tinctures, all kinds of workarounds. Uh, and at the same time, if you look at alcohol, the alcohol industry, you know, they could do all these things with alcohol, but they don't. I mean, you could spray it, you could you could vape it. But why would you? You could just have a drink. And that's because it's easy to do because alcohol is water soluble. So you can just make a beverage, consume it, and it works quickly and predictably. And, and, and so you don't need to do anything else. Right. So nano emulsions solve for that. Nano emulsions can be basically this. So once you make it, you can have it in the powdered form or in the liquid form. Once you dose it into, in this case, water, but it could be any water compatible beverage, water-based beverage. Yeah. You stir them in, they, they go in, and they will remain permanently stable in there. Uh, powders could be also compressed into tablets, and then the beverage is your saliva in a way. It dissolves in your saliva, uh, quickly disintegrates, and then you, you kind of swallow that, and, and it's sort of a saliva beverage, if you will. Right. <laughs> um, so, so convenience is clearly there, especially if these things are translucent, because they don't even change the way that your products look. Right. Now, um, this is on the function. So this is some basic data that, that, that we got. So these two lines, the, the red line and whatever this color is, I guess it's blue. <laughs> so this is a typical edible on a full stomach and an empty stomach. It hits you uh, near three and a half hours or so. That's, that's where the peak is. When you consume the same amount in the form of an nano emulsion as a beverage, you get a green and a purple line, and that, that, that's empty versus full stomach. And we can get into the difference between why that changes things, whether it's empty or full. But, but um, overall, nano emulsions are much faster, and the peak effect is much stronger, and the bioavailability overall is higher because, well, there's this long tail that you don't really feel, so, so you can just cut that off. Anyway, bioavailability right. goes up, onset of action is shorter. So nano emulsions solve for those two things. Um, the reason this happens, so this is a very busy slide, but we don't need the entire slide. The reason this happens is because when you consume an oil in just a form of oil, triglycerides, basic oils and fats, or, or anything else oil compatible, it arrives in your small intestine as kind of like a blob. And this big drop or this blob of oil is not water compatible, so it can't really get through the aqueous environment of the small intestine to the wall of the small intestine where the enterocyte cells are, where things get absorbed. In order for that to happen, it goes through this lengthy process uh, in situ of enzymatic conversion into something called mixed micelles. So it starts like this and it, it ends up being these little micelles. These little micelles are uh, basically nanoparticles, nano droplets. Uh, with oil on the inside, so inside this yellow section that, that's oil, the size uh, of, of a micelle is about 20 nanometers, 10 to 25 or so, depending on what's inside. And then things like CBD, uh, THC, and bioactives, they can find their way to the inside of this. And now these things are water compatible. They can travel, they can get to these enterocyte cells, which look like the, these little hairs, and then they can get absorbed. So. Uh, it's important to remember what the size is here because that defines the nano emulsion that you'll be making. Yeah. Nano emulsions are basically these created outside of the body. That's why they work immediately instead of taking an hour and a half to even get started. And that's right. why they get absorbed 
all in one shot. So the peak effect is not smeared, the peak is higher. And they get absorbed more completely because otherwise it's a, it's a competition between absorption and illumination. As, as you're waiting for these things to be formed, they go through the body and, and out. So you're literally throw, <laughs> throwing lots of things down the toilet. Right. So this particle size distribution is um, measured for narrow emulsions and it's about the same as mixed micelles. Right. This is why it works. Uh, another the confirmation of, of the droplet size being important and kind of a detailed confirmation is this very elegant study that um, is in the literature. So this is not for cannabis related, but uh, it works more or less the same way with narrow emulsions, no matter what the active is. So these, uh, these guys compared nano emulsions with different droplet sizes and their performance to each other. So at the bottom here, you see 400 nanometers. It's not really a nano emulsion even. It's like a basic emulsion. Right. And at the top, that's 25 nanometers. And you see what happens to blood concentration after a period of time. It, it, right. So, so um, the smaller the droplets, the better. But once you get to about 20, then it's diminishing returns. Like you can see that even like 40 and, and, and 25 doesn't make a big difference. So we typically say if you're under 50 on the medium droplet size, you're right. in a good place. And to verify that, uh, we recommend a couple of things. Uh, that's a very typical question that people ask us. Like, how do you know that nanomalgin is actually there, that it's good? Right. So there are two main things that you need to do. Measure the droplet sizes. So this is what you should expect from a good uh, liquid nanomalgin, the D50, which is more or less the median of the distribution, is under 30 somewhere 25, 27 uh, nanometers. And for a powder, after you put it into water, reconstitute it. If it's under 50, that's good. Uh, if it's under 200, that's still very good. Mm -hmm. It's not the best, but, but it's pretty good. And so mm -hmm. uh, you can make tablets out of it or, or, or just powder that goes into liquids or just a liquid that goes into a liquid beverage. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing you can do for translucent nanomulsions, which they become when the droplets are smaller than 100 nanometers, is visual observation. So as you can see, so this is nanomulsions that it's the same formulation. It just, you process it longer and longer and it goes more and more translucent as a, as a function of time. So when you're above 100, uh, you're completely opaque. And as you go down at 30, it's translucent in its concentrated form. Once you dose it, it's transparent. So sometimes you can avoid having to buy expensive droplet size measurement equipment, for example, dynamic light scattering or laser diffraction equipment, by just understanding that they become translucent. You just you can just see it. Another thing is stability. Typically, this is done over a period of time to make sure that the droplets don't change the, the size of them. But if they're translucent, you can just watch for changes in translucency for stability. So uh, it, it helps you avoid having to buy this 50 to $80,000 piece of equipment. Right. But another thing that really should be done is potency measurement. And that is something that you guys know a lot more than we do about, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, typically HPLC, there are other methods. And this is something that you typically would need to do over a period of time. Incidentally, right. in this in this case, we're showing that if you keep nanoemulsions in a clear container, both are glass, but dark container, it just stays at the same level. But in the clear glass, it gets oxidized after about half a year. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not in, in direct light. It's just standing in the lab. So uh, under direct light, it would be a little faster. Does your particle size typically stay the same at over time too, or yes? Yeah. If it's properly made, we have some nanomolgens that were made three, four years ago, and they're still okay. The same. So same distribution, no, no, dis, no changes in the distribution at all. Or are they? Uh, can you can you look at aging at all from that standpoint? So for about half a year, there is nothing. After about a year, you can see the edges smear out a little bit. Okay. So the statistics. So, so some so, because. If it goes one way, it never comes back. Right. It's, it's in it's in a kinetic stability pocket. Yeah. But it's not a thermodynamic energy minimum for nano emulsions. Okay. <laughs> so once it's 
if it happens to be out, it will never come back. So some particles over a long period of time will find themselves outside there. And then it's kind of like a ratchet. You can go one way, but not the other way. So right. the edge is going to smear out. Um, but uh, the median more or less stays the same for a year for sure. And after a couple of years, it's still within maybe 10, 20 percent, um, depending on the formulation, of course, and how you kept it. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be in the fridge even. If it's sterile, oh, it's important to filter it so that okay. there's no it is important to filter it. OK, because you otherwise want to have particles in there, right, uh, that would produce uh, points of agglomeration. Is that what you're is that what is that why you'd filter it? No, it's for for microbial activity. Microbial be, activity. Oh, I see. I see. Because yeah. fungus and things like that, they they always they're they're present in the environment when you made it. Right. And uh, you sterilize it in some way, and filtration is the easiest way to do it. And there's also other stuff like this, the, the particles. And so once you filter it, none of that remains, and uh, there's no fungus uh, and 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 other microorganisms uh, because those. They, they love this stuff, you know. We're not the only ones who like <laughs> cannabinoids. Right. They also do, and 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 surfactants they like, and carrier oils they just eat, right. them and they grow. So, tell me a little bit about you know the we're talking a lot about stability here, um, it, and you have a purely mechanical uh, means of maintaining stability. It does it is it does it work at all along with the surfactant? Because I know a lot of people are asking are there added surfactants to it what what just to stabilize what do you guys typically recommend and do uh there because like some of the some of the stabilizers themselves may have you know may have certain flavors associated with it may sometimes you can't taste anything depending on the concentration what, what's been your experiences there so there are several very important aspects to a correctly prepared formulation First of all, you need a carrier oil. It's a frequently misunderstood situation. You actually need an oil that a cannabinoid or an, a, an extract, a mixture of cannabinoids or whatnot, will be first dissolved into. Uh, unless you have that, you get all kinds of weird effects. First of all, it's hard to get to the appropriately low droplet size because of the viscosity differences between water and cannabis extracts. You have to match the viscosities as much as you can. So you have to kind of thin it out. Otherwise, the droplets don't, don't break up very well. Uh, second of all, uh, there's something called ostal ripening. Ostal ripening is a destabilization mechanism, but somewhat complex. But basically, if there's any water solubility that cannabinoids actually do have a, a little bit of, then small droplets will slowly that diffuse into large ones because uh, there's Laplace pressure in the small droplets. They're unhappy. They're, the curvature is too great. So they're under pressure. So the solubility of oils in the vicinity of small droplets is a little bit higher than it is in the vicinity of larger droplets. So if you have a slight difference between two different droplets in size, mm -hmm. and it's always in a slight equilibrium of oil a little bit outside, but most inside. We're talking like a tiny fraction, it's parts per billion, right? But, but over time, this part per billion, if it comes out of a small droplet, it won't go back to it. It'll go back to a larger droplet because it's easier for it to do that. So over time, small droplets will kind of deflate and disappear and the large ones will grow. That, that's called dust ripening. Proper carrier oils inhibit that. Okay. They give it a more hospitable environment and surfactants also inhibit that by removing surface tension or alleviating surface tension. So the plus pressure is not so great. I see. So carrier oils are important. Second of all, you need surfactants that are tasteless, uh, preferably, but you can't really get away with one surfactant if you're going to do this properly. There's something called matching the HLB value. So every combination of uh, cannabinoids and respective um, carrier oils will have a particular, uh, it's called required HLB, a, a particular a lipophilic um, hydrophilic balance uh, of surfactants that it wants to see in order to uh, minimize the surface tension of the droplets. Right. And that can be achieved by balancing two or more surfactants, sometimes co-surfactants 
sometimes called solvents. Uh, it's a somewhat complex matrix of parameters that has to be optimized to make this particular uh, bioactive that you're trying to non-emulsify mm -hmm. happy. Uh, it's uh, especially hard to make an all-in-one formulation that would be broad spectrum that would be able to do this with a bunch of things because each one likes to see different HLBs. Right. Uh, but, but it's doable. Uh, nano stabilizers that, that we offer do that. So, um, and lastly, you do need something to prevent microbial activity. Even if you filter it, nothing's ever perfect and something always gets through. And so you need a little bit of um, something like sodium benzoate or, or sorbic acid or yeah. potassium, things like that. A right. little bit. It's all food grade, but, but you, you do need some. Yeah, so it's it's rather it it is a complicated uh, set because there are you, know, you have you have surfactants more than one surfactant they have to work together and then you have to have the right carrier oil and then you also have to have the API or the uh, or the or the drug or or in our case the oil from the cannabis uh, and then in addition to that you have to have the processing technology along with the conditions on the process technology so coming up with the right set of conditions that will get you the right set of parent, uh, right exactly what you want, um, everything being tasteless and maybe even translucent, lucent is a, is a big job. It's a lot of work. And, yeah. and, and it's a, it can be tricky too. Uh, so um, that's why you need experts really there to help you help you really solve that uh, equation. Agreed. One, one other thing is important is, oh, let me skip through this. Like the, the, I already talked about this. This is basically ultronic system and nano stabilizer or alternative formulation. You need both of these to be successful with it. But importantly, well, this is something about cavitation, but importantly- Oh, well, I like that, cavitation, that's awesome. Let me show this. So the driving force of, of ultrasonic processing is cavitation. Uh -huh. And it's relevant here because there's this, when you, when you scale up, there's this one thing that's very important to make sure that happens. And I wanna show you what this is. So cavitation is basically this. When you expose a liquid to ultrasound, it creates this white cloud of cavitation, which is vacuum bubbles that grow on the upstroke of the horn. So the horn kind of goes up and down like this. It's, you can't see it, but, but you can see the effects of it. So they grow and then they you get to the maximum size and then they implode onto themselves and create microjets. So the key to everything is this microjet. The intensity of this microjet has to be sufficient to break up the droplet into nano particles, into, into nano droplets or hard particles into nano, nano particles. And so what you want is when you go from lab scale to industrial, you don't want this to happen. You don't want the right. amplitude vibration to, to go down because then the quality dies. Right. What you want is, so this is unique to our technology. It's, uh, we call it barbell horn ultrasonic technology. It's the only way to scale up uh, the sizes of horns and make sure that the amplitude doesn't doesn't oh, go down. It's amplitude modulation. We're back to AM processing. Yeah, we get the AM right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, so, so when you go from lab to bench to industrial, you can expect the same quality of the product, just more productivity per unit of time if the amplitude is is kept the same. So, okay. So that that's essential. Hey, and, um, and this is one part. One one question that we do get from some of our customers is what's the difference between say um you know say a, a physical processing mechanism and and an emulsion system and and say an oil and water emulsion uh, are, are they the same thing so yeah interesting so i have a slide on that somewhere down here oh, yeah here we go so there are several ways to make oils and, and water compatible. There's a basic emulsion, macro emulsion, that's big drops of oil whipped together with some lecithin or whatever. So they don't stay together for, for so long. So that's not a, a way to make uh, products. But there's this other thing, it's called micro emulsion or micelles. So these are done by self emulsifying systems. That's when you have so much surfactant, uh, typically a bunch of surfactants, uh, optimized very carefully together, and lots of other things, carrier oils and co-solvents, co-surfactants, and things like that, that you can create thermodynamic energy minimum. Basically, you change the property of water so much that it actually dissolves oil. It's solubilized. So this is what the farmer uses, but um, it's not recommended for anyone who has any other options. And 
and the pharma is basically has moved away from it to nanoemulsions. And that's because the quantity of surfactants exceeds the, the quantity of oil that you're nanoemulsifying by a factor of 10 or 20. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to do it. So, but on the flip side, you don't need equipment. So if I understood your question correctly, like why couldn't you just use kind of a self emulsifying system and skip the equipment? Correct. Well, it's because the driving force here is chemical versus mechanical when you use equipment. And the difference is that the chemical driving force in the form of the chemicals that you put in remains in your finished product. So yeah. your finished product has all these things that made it happen in the first place. And that's a lot of chemicals and they're right. harsh. Right. When you use mechanical energy, once you turn off the system, there's no more presence of what you did in order to get that to happen. Right. All you have to do is maintain. And to maintain, you can use milder stuff and a lot less of it. So I see. Can you get the stuff. same particle size approximately, yeah. or is it okay? So the oil and water emulsion would give the similar particle size, but you you would have so much of that excess uh, chemicals there that you'd be tasting it and and things like that. that that's the main. Much more than taste it. You probably yeah. you very easily you get out of compliance and and you you feel the effects of them. I mean they're okay. basically. But uh, oil and water emulsion is a general name for all of these things. Yeah. So the distinction I'm making is between nano emulsion and micro emulsion. And micro emulsion is an unfortunate term because micro doesn't mean it's microns. It's actually the same nano droplets. Uh, but you just get there in a different way. Um, let me maybe let, let, let's let me, let me ask you some questions because. Um, I mean, there, there are lots of things that that are extremely important before you even get to anything that we do. Yes. Which is, well, uh, I guess, first of all, what is the right way to extract given a particular purpose? Specifically, what I mean is for vaping or dabbing, I'm assuming that the extract that you're looking for is not necessarily the same as the extract that you'd be looking for if you're making a nano emulsion. So yeah. the, the, I guess the biggest question is, what is the right, let me, let me get out of my presentation here. Um, what is even the best technique? Like there, there, there are hydrocarbons, right? Yep. There is ethanol, specifically cryogenic ethanol seems to have become very popular because you don't yes. have to winter. And then there's CO2 with which you can do subcritical, supercritical and manipulate what you're doing in so many different ways. Yes. Uh, so maybe could you give us a good overview of which one to choose for what purpose? Sure. Well, um, interesting. I, you know, I really like that graph that you put out with bioavailability. And, um, and you know, suppose you're going to take uh, an extract and it has, um, you know, it has, it has um, contaminants in it, like um, residual ethanol, residual hydrocarbon, like uh, pentane or heptane or hexane even, and then you're going to nano emulsify that. So it's very bioavailable. You're basically nano emulsifying uh, toxins and they're going to become very bioavailable and they're going to go into your, into your body. They, they'll be metabolized in the order of three, three, four hours. But if you wonder why you might get a headache uh, or something like that on an unexpected result from uh, you know taking a, a, a nano emulsified material or even a even a vapor pen because it, it vaporizes and goes through your lungs pretty nicely, it's probably because there's a lot of contaminants in there. So the very very first step uh, that I always look at when I look at uh, extracts, I really look at the quality of the extracts and the um, extraction method, you want to make sure that they are, that, that it's, it, that there's not a lot of um, contaminants being added to it. Uh, so a couple different things you need to think about there. Um, you're right. Um, you know, like ethanol extractions have been very, very popular lately. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a couple different ways to do an ethanol extract and you can do it in low temperature or high temperature, but you know, the quality of the ethanol makes all the difference. So if I'm going to buy a food grade ethanol and that has a certification on it, it may have very, very minimal amounts of contaminants in it enough where it would, you know, satisfy a food grade specification. 
But if I'm going to buy like a 2A solvent or something like that, uh, where it's denatured, and then I'm going to try to remove the denaturant, and, and you're still going to have 5,000 ppm in there of your denaturant, and then you're going to try to nano emulsify that, I don't think that that's an appropriate uh, oil to try to nano emulsify because you're just going to make it very bioavailable uh, for, you know, Delicious. hexane, hexane, things like that. So, and the reality is, is that the FDA has no, um, they have no data on the overall long-term acute effects of some of those, uh, some of those molecules that I just mentioned. We know that hexane is is much more uh, required to have a lot less. It's known it's known toxicity. Okay, but if but for example, people are using a lot of heptane right now to denature their ethanol, um, and I if see. you're going to use that. And then you're going to nano emulsify it. You're going to make it more available. We don't have any data whatsoever on the effects of the endocrine, endocrine disrupting factors, cognitive ability, cognitive uh, effects over time. There's no data at all. And okay. so the, the specifications of 5,000 ppm really go back to a meeting they had in the 70s with the uh, industrial, um, the industrial pharmaceutical complex and the FDA, and they, they just basically said, okay, we agree to have this amount based on, for example, a, a, a one study from 25 Sprague Dali rats. We've learned a lot about the human body since then. So I would just say that if you're going to go into the nano world, you better make sure that you have the most pure substances available because all of those contaminants are also going to be very, very bioavailable after Dr. Alexi gets through with your, <laughs> through with it. So they're going to be bioavailable. So That's I would great. say that, um, you know, and that goes for CO2 too, but um, the CO2 is cryogenically derived. It's uh, goes into a gas and then it's recompressed. So it's extremely clean. Um, unless you're adding stuff to it, you know, it's really, um, it's, it's really, it's really extremely clean. So um, I would say that, you know, there are a couple of different ways to do it. Obviously you have butane, propane, which is a, you know, that people use that all the time. Um, you know, the residuals are well known in those and they're, they're basically, they can range from hydrocarbon branched molecules, um, you know, things like that. So, uh, you know, I would, if I were to select um, a extract that would be the most, uh, the most advantageous in terms of reducing or eliminating any possible contamination, I would use a CO2 extract. Um, if I was if I was going to use like a, a tincture, um, I probably wouldn't be, I would be okay to use, uh, you know, an ethanol extract with a food grade ethanol. That would be mm -hmm. fine because it's coming in, you know, a tincture is typically, it's put onto the tongue, it's, it's absorbed sublingually. Um, and, you know, you're not really talking about the same absorption rates. Uh, what doctor, what you're talking about is really high, high sorption rates. Uh, and I suppose that would be done sublingually too, right? If you put a nano emulsion under your tongue. Yeah. Okay. So, so typically, typically it, it, it mixes with saliva and you swallow it without knowing right. it, but right. you could put some delay. So food grade ethanol. So ethanol doesn't get nano emulsified because it's water soluble. So whatever trace you might be, have of an oil that used was used to denature it, that's going to get nano emulsified. And so, great point. If it's a denatured alcohol type extraction, then it's or even probably yeah, or even a, like um, well, there's some a lot higher carbon, uh, you know, like in butane and propane um, that are basically when they they don't really distill it, they they yep. they, they condense it. it, and when they condense it, there's other stuff in there that um, also would be very fat soluble, and it would also and that's why they have to purge their extracts out in order to get those out. And they go through a large, you know, heating and cooling and our heating and vacuum, heating and vacuum to purge uh, that stuff out of like a butane extract. So I think that a butane extract is really great for, you know, the, uh, for things like if you're going to, um, you know, if you're going to put it into uh, like an edible or something like that, that's going to go into the gut it's going to be, uh, you know, metabolized. It's probably any of the contaminants are going to be very, not very bioavailable because it's not, like you said, it's not hitting that emulsion until much later. Um, and, you know, so I think, yeah. So I would always look at, the, you know, the purity of the extracts and I've been that way and have kind of advocated for that. Um, a lot of the GMP producers, uh, Dr. Alexi, all over the world have kind of landed along those lines too. 
Um, they don't want to deal with, um, you know, contaminants. They don't want to deal with validation. And then, and then cost is also a big deal. So, um, you know, the other thing that I would say in terms of the different types of extracts um, would be, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, if you have um, a very complex extract, like it has all the terpenes, it has all the fats, it has waxes in there, it has the flavonoids in there, it has all of the plant component trees and everything. It's almost better to have something uh, more pure, I would imagine, uh, just so just it would be more stable. I guess that's one question that I have for you. Um, but, you know, what I would recommend in terms of an oil, I would always keep the, uh, the terpenes out. I would not put them into a nano emulsified product because you're going to taste the terpenes and they're going to mm -hmm. taste different. People like to smoke those, not, not so much uh, yeah. taste the terpenes because they're solvents is what they are. Um, you know, people like uh, once they're nebulized or they're put into a vapor, they taste great. Uh, but you know, to actually put that into a system, you know, I'm not really sure uh, how that's really helping. So what is the effect of terpenes on, on your uh, stability of your uh, nano emulsions, Dr. Alexi? So on stability, uh, no stability wise, they're fine. They're oils. Okay. They, they get, they get mixed into. They do, they do react yeah. and, uh, you know, they, they are very reactive. Uh, a lot of the terpenes are extremely unstable too. Uh, if they so, oxidize or, or become unstable because of light or because of oxygen yeah. you're in your water, then yes, they can they can go through chemical transformations. And so can CBD. Uh, you saw in that slide what 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 light does to it, and and yeah. it this uh, way of becoming a quinone and, and and turning red and like if you let it oxidize. Um, but the taste the taste is is a million dollar question because. Um, it's a great point that vaping and drinking is not the same thing. And also when you taste an oil directly under your tongue versus when you nano emulsify it, it's a completely different experience it's because when it's in an oil form, it's not bioavailable to your taste buds. It's just not very bioavailable at all. But, but when you make it effectively water soluble, you make it available to everything, including your taste buds. So conditioning the extract before you not emulsify it is a huge and kind of an unknown field. So the ability to manipulate your extract in every which way possible and possibly not in the way that the industry typically likes to do because it's a different target uh, is very valuable. And that's, that's where you guys, I think, are probably the best people in, in the world, certainly the best people I know uh, uh, to do this with, which <laughs> precipitates lots of questions. No Specifically, problem. What is it that's bitter? What is that thing that's bitter? And it's there no matter how hard you try to clean it up, like fractional distillation or even chromatography, sometimes even both. And in, is it CBD itself? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, you can take isolate and you can, you can, you can take isolate, you put it in, in your tongue, you can taste that. It, it has like almost like a, a dry, bitter taste to it you yeah. know there is I mean, um, you know, it isolate it. itself has you know sometimes it's not like you're not going to have a hundred percent isolate usually you, you, you're talking about 99 percent. so that other stuff is maybe just a little bit of waxes maybe some some other cannabinoids um yeah. you know like cbc sometimes co-precipitate cbg will co-precipitate uh, but i think they all kind of have that little that little taste to it and I don't think you're going to get around that without some sort of masking agent or something like that. I mean, you can make it a lot worse, obviously, by adding mm -hmm. in, you know, like really janky terps in there or something like that, that, that will make it taste horrible. Um, but the, the material itself is bitter. Now, you know, when you vape something uh, that, and it, it, it may have some like little burn or something, that's, that's, those are terpenes. Those are, mm -hmm. those are just purely terpenes there. Um, you know, when you vape them, they can, they can inflame uh, the back of your throat. Um, so I, I, I don't think that that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the bitter taste. The other the thing actual. that I have seen, Dr. Alexi, is um, I have seen like chlorophylls will also have a, a bitter taste to them. Now, there's no chlorophyll in there because it is not green. I mean, you can't see it. It doesn't absorb. Um, but there's a lot of chlorophyll like materials uh, in there that are, you know, the xanthophylls are there, right? 
definitely. Um, those are not, those don't taste very good. I don't think, um, with, you know, I've tried the xanthophils from the standards, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, just kind of, you know, once you taste them, I always like to taste it. Uh, but they're, you know, you, you, you see, they don't taste very good. So you kind of know where it is kind of trying to like a wine connoisseur, you're trying to understand, okay, what chemicals are contributing to overall, overall taste. So I would say that the CBD uh, itself has some contribution. Uh, what do you think? Have you, you've tried obviously isolate and, and kind of experienced what I've experienced? Yeah. So, so, so we are basically at the point when we now no longer think that making your extract as pure and as clean as possible is the right thing to do. Uh, because a couple of times we worked with an extract that was very basic. It was just winterized, but it had as much, it just didn't have any obvious chlorophyll and heavy waxes. And that was one of the best extracts as far as taste, because um, just like it, it, it was a great point um, about wine or, or, well, for me personally, I like whiskey, for example, I wouldn't want tasteless whiskey. I want whiskey that it's an acquired taste, but I've acquired it <laughs> several times over. Okay, you say... and me both. Okay, <laughs> you a bourbon or scotch? Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scotch. Single oh, okay, malt. all right, all right. So I, I like the yeah. Balvini. Uh, it's my favorite. Um, the Balvini 12 year. It's absolutely gorgeous. It has. Do you like that? You like the Balvini's distillery? It's I like, like Balvini. I, uh, um, yeah. Gallon is more of my go to. Oh, McAllen. Okay. Yeah, it's all good. I got a nice 18 year old bottle. We should try to try sometime. Yeah, since so uh, it's, yeah, it's all good. You don't have to ask me twice. <laughs> okay. But they do have a taste. And so yeah. the experience we had with the beverage we made from this extract, I don't even remember where it came from, but it was very kind of basic and very well rounded. And it tasted like something that you can acquire a taste for. It wasn't aggressively bitter. It was like bitter, but but it was bitter like like hops is bitter in an appropriate beverage. You know, it's mm -hmm. like a little bit of a bitter contribution. There were many other very nice rounded contributions, and I'm thinking maybe cannabis beverages could become something like that, something that you actually put the taste in and and develop and age it on develop purpose. Develop a required taste to it, absolutely, yeah. Because yeah. this 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 rush to make it taste like nothing, I, I yeah. think kind of. The purpose it's even like disrespectful in a way to the right. plant it is a little disrespectful i agree with you okay so let's let's talk about this i mean like uh, i think a lot of it is because people want to put it in seltzers yeah and they want it to be fruity and yeah. you know all that stuff i mean well, no, why not just stuff. have it taste like the plant why not yeah. have it just taste like you know like the hemp plant that's the way it should be um because so, done it yet. like nobody's come up with a product that people will just say whoa yeah. Oh, yeah. Seltzer. There's I so many seltzer. different preferences that we're dealing with. I mean, that's why I kind of give up. I'm like, okay, I like it, but I'm pretty much sure no one else will. <laughs> so, yeah. You like it? There's going to be people who also like it. Yeah, there right? probably will. Like I'm, I'm pretty good at tasting vapes and um, I'm pretty good at uh, any kind of water, water soluble stuff. I, I, you know, I like that, but people want to mask it so much. Like, um, a lot of our clients, they want, okay, we want to have a berry flavor or we want to yeah. have a, you know, a coffee flavor. Well, why I'm not just did. the hemp, why not just the hemp flavor? You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Why not just, uh, you know, some, some other type of flavor like that? I don't know, but I, I do think that you're right. I mean, uh, there's been a lot of people have tried to apply the, apply the extracts to, you know, like other beverages, uh, you know, carbonated beverages and non-carbonated beverages. And they're always trying to add so much sugar and everything into it. I think it's going to be like you say, uh, those are the ones that are probably going to make it, you know, make some really nice tasting hemp, hemp water, right? Yeah. I mean, and, have and you ever seen that product out on the market? I haven't. I mean, most people are, most people no, are not doing that. Right. No, no, nobody's done it yet. Um, there, there needs to be someone like a, a talented company that's just good at being brave about developing flavors that are not nothing, that are actually right. something, something good. 
<laughs> okay, Dr. Alexi, we're going to partner up. That's all there is to it. <laughs> we're going to make it go. <laughs> and then we'll let's be the only one because... tipping the glass. Oh, boy, this is really great. <laughs> no, it'll be that. good. Yeah, so. But I, I, would, I would absolutely love to partner up with you and develop a, a beverage that, that we can adjust the flavor of the way that we like. Like a, um, yes, like a, a, like a beverage that, that stays true to the plant. You know, yeah. instead of disrespecting the plant, it kind of like that's what you're saying, right? I mean, it's so you're avoiding, you're avoiding, you're like, I, I am kind of doing it, but I'm not doing it. Like, I don't want to yeah. look like, I don't want to feel like I'm doing it, but I'm doing right. it and nobody knows. Right. Okay, I'm with you on that one. I, 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 we'll have to take this conversation offline. I, I like that. I like the idea. So, um, yeah, right. I mean, we could do it. Um, what do you think we should do? We should, um, we could have different like cannabis sativa, we could have a Bubba Kush. We could have a uh, we could have an OG an OG Kush with uh, with a Skittles uh, you know flavor or whatever you know people yeah, these are the flavors that people really have grown up to to love. I mean in the you know in this in the you know in the flower right yeah yeah and follow follow like the wine or and 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 maybe whiskey uh, right. industries lead like you know give it a nice sounding name and give yes. it. A number of years or something. <laughs> or, yeah, no, I got it. I got it. Kush, yeah, kind of Kush age it a little bit. Why not? Age it. We can age say it. <laughs> Kush 2020. You know, hindsight is 20. 20 yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Maybe when we're cracking over our uh, open our 20 year 20 years from now <laughs> and put, and putting them out. You know, who knows? Maybe it'll be really good. So, yeah. um, okay. Well, you know, on the. Yeah, so I, I really think that I, I really like what you got, Dr. Alexi. It's it's really That's awesome. Right. Um, you know, if there is a good go-to guy, I mean, it, you know, that hey, look, somebody's trying to solve a problem with with taste and flavor, Dr. Alexi and his company really is the go-to company for that. And I I just appreciate what you guys have really brought to the to the table. And um obviously there's lots of knowledge there. Give me a little bit of background you know, I mean, how long have you been involved in this, Dr. Alexi? It sounds like you've been doing that for a long, long time. Yeah, so we're a little bit like you. We started in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, this company started in 2006. And we've been mostly working with the pharmaceutical industry uh, in the beginning. And then somewhere around 2015, I would say, right, Eva? Around 2015, we started seeing demand in the cannabis industry and basically like 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 you guys we it was slow at first and then it just exploded and there were a couple of years that everybody just wanted to make nano emulsions all the time yeah. and it's slowing down a bit now but I'm, I'm i feel like it's not really slow now it's a transitional period uh, now liquids are less in demand more powders and so we got heavily into that and and now standalone things because with liquids dosing is an issue you have to count drops or have a dropper or something like that. But if right. you make a tablet, you, you know the dose. And so that's coming popular. And um, I think now the beverage industry is, is, is trying to understand what's happening to it. Right. <laughs> and, and then well, when beverages uh, can be properly made and, and self-respecting ways, right. um, it, it's, it's going to pick up. Uh, so yeah, are our, our spray, timeline. Are you guys spray drying the, um, the, the the extracts? Is that what or the emulsions? Is uh, that what you're doing? So there's a way to to make a nano emulsion that already includes all the all the binders into in it that you could just spray dry. Yes, and and uh, create the powder. We don't use spray drying ourselves. We have a different method. It's proprietary, but but it's uh, spray drying is just as good. It's just the equipment is a little bit more expensive. Uh, but um, uh, when you just take a liquid nano emulsion and dry it, you'll not get a powder because there's nothing solid in it to begin with. It's all kind of gunky stuff. Right. So you'll just nasty goo. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, th there's a different uh, formulation that, that 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 can be dried as well. For. Um, but I think uh, there's going to be another piece of the puzzle uh, that is the actual finished beverage or whatever finished product it is production. So uh, between your ability to condition the raw material, our ability to convert it into water compatible form and the final product developer to properly flavor it, package it and, and distribute it, 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 it could be a complete 
well, somebody needs to grow it <laughs> also. Yeah, yeah, so it's a four step. I, I guess now we're talking about two technologies in the center of it, but then we need one at the very beginning and one at the very end. So right. next webinar, we <laughs> include a couple. Yeah, absolutely. Of them. Well, these guys now are trying to grow it in bio bags. You've heard about that? Um, I, 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 I heard don't, of them. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of like, yeah. It's kind of like synthetically grown meat. I, I don't, I'm not a fan. I can tell you that right now. I mean, yeah. I'm just not going to, I mean, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. So, but, uh, um, you know, to, uh, but to a lot of people who want to be sustainable and everything, I guess maybe, maybe, maybe we'll get used to it someday. I don't know. That's on the result. I mean, if, if it produces good product, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can be forgiven for being sustainable. <laughs> yes, exactly. If it produces good product, that's a good point. I, I tell them that. Do you think they, do you think they would have a, like a biosynthetic, um, you know, Balvini. I don't think so. Uh, you know, I just don't think so. <laughs> I, I would like go that. against the grain of what it's all about. You know, Highland, Highland is 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 the place. So anyway, yeah. we have to have a um, a couple of uh, sessions, uh, Alexi, on that, on on specifically on whiskey, um, because I have a big, I have a, I have a, I have a lot of uh, interest in that, and obviously there's lots of polyphenols in there and all kinds of things. You know, I got, um, I have ice uh, that I've harvested, harvested from the uh, Kikinik Glacier in Alaska that I put in my, in my, uh, you know, in my drink, you know, every now and then, um, just, just if I, if I want some ice in there. So I got, to, they say it's 25 million year old ice. <laughs> and I put that in my, in my well, you're, not, you're not, you're not huh? joking around with these things. You're pretty pretty serious about yeah, your, pretty your... serious i'm very pretty serious so anyway so well it's it's been really good joining you doctor and uh yeah I guess that, you know very it, much. Uh, we'll have to do this again uh soon let's do it again yeah and thank Eva, you so... yeah thank you very much for everything and i appreciate your time yeah it was good to have you um thank you so much for the great discussion okay um, yeah no um, for those of you who are watching or listening, if you have not visited the websites of the two companies, be sure to check those out, sunmechanics.com and extractlab.com. And then you'll find tons of educational materials related to equipment, nano emulsification, extractions, and other related topics. Um, also, if you have any questions, we would love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to contact us. Um, the contact information is on the screen as well as in the description of the video. And subscribe to our YouTube channel, of course. <laughs> Thanks for watching, listening to this discussion. See you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank you. John. Bye.